Good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Katherine Hemmons and it's my pleasure to be your service leader today. I'm filling in for Sally Wants. I thank you all in advance for your patience with my offering, <laughs> taking Sally's place. I'm joined today by Jim McDermott behind the camera, Jay Gettler on computer, and our guest minister, Reverend Dennis Reynolds, who you'll meet shortly. Let's begin our service with enjoying Spirit of Life, um, sung and pre-recorded by our beloved Jeff Lovejoy. Sing out loud at home and we may do the same here. <laughs> probably have 30 more. We brought our own, you know, drinks, food, chairs, tables, blankets, masks, until we rather sat down and were social distanced. And it was so great to see each other. Probably the best thing, the hardest thing rather, was to not hug each other. I do miss those hugs. We're going to do it again fairly soon. It will be in the blast probably in another maybe three weeks. And, boy, please come. At this time, I invite Jim to come forward to light our flame of our chalice as I read the following from Jerry Kowalski. With faith to face our challenges, with love that casts out fear, with hope to trust tomorrow. We accept each day as the gift it is, a reason for rejoicing. Thank you. Next, our joys and concerns. This is the time of our service that we share our joys and concerns. We do this to share our true natures with each other. We do this to ask for support of our loving community. And we do this to raise our voice in happiness and grace. If you have a joy or concern to share with the community, you can go to the FOOF website and, you know, and share it there, and someone will pass it on to me. 
So please do. It's a chance to, again, connect in the way that you would like. And we really appreciate it. Today, first our concern, more than a concern, a sorrow. It's with a heavy heart that I share the loss of our friend, Glenn Hanko, who passed away last Sunday, the 14th. His wife, Maya, is doing as best as can be expected. And we share her, we send her, rather, all of our love and support. She's a fairly new member of our community, but we embraced her immediately as she embraced us. We're there for you, Maya. Another one, our thoughts and prayers go out to Bruce Yelly, a longtime member of our congregation who's recovering from eyelid surgery necessary to improve his eyesight, uh, to, uh, dealing with his Parkinson's, his own Parkinson's. Your work is so important in our community, your death and dying legislation, and we need you out there. We love you, Bruce. Anyone else? Anyone else here have a joy and concern that they'd like to share? Okay. We'll go on. And today we are joined by the Reverend Dennis Reynolds, who spoke to us last night about, I'm sorry, last month about angels in America. He lives in Eugene and has traveled to be here to be with us today to bring his special message titled, Founding Fathers, Future Fathers. Before Reverend Dennis comes to the pulpit, he'd like you to enjoy a song titled Dear Theodosia from the musical Hamilton. It's quite a good prelude to his message. Enjoy. what to say to you you have my eyes you have your mother's name when you came into the world you cried and it broke my heart I'm dedicating every day to you domestic life was never quite my style when you smile you knocked me out, I fall apart And I thought I was so smart You will come of age with our young nation We'll bleed and fight for you We'll make it right for you If we lay a strong enough foundation We'll pass it on to you We'll give the world to you And you'll blow us all away Someday, someday You'll blow us all away Someday, someday Ooh, Philip, when you smile I am undone My son, look at my son Pride is not the word I'm looking for There is so much more inside me now Philip, you outshine the morning sun, my son. When you smile, I fall apart, and I thought I was so smart. My father wasn't around. My father wasn't around. I swear that I'll be around for you. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll make a million mistakes. I'll make the world safe and sound for you. We'll come of age with our young nation. We'll bleed and fight for you. We'll make it right for you. If we lay a strong enough foundation, we'll pass it on to you. We'll give the world to you and you'll blow us all away.
this Father's Day is a very special one for me. It's my first Father's Day as a grandfather. My three-month-old grandson, Jasper, has recently returned to the well. It wasn't a return for him because he was born in South Africa. They repatriated uh, his mother and father and he um, back to the U.S. just a few weeks ago. They're currently living with us. Um, the potential tumult in that country in result of the pandemic is even higher risks than what we face in this country. So they've chosen to be here for a while. So this year I am reminded about the lines from that song. When you smile at me, I am undone. There is so much inside me now. You outshine the morning sun. When you smile, I fall apart. Those lines take on new meanings that I haven't experienced since my own children were young. So too, it deepens my desire to do whatever it takes to make the world safe and sound for him, for all the children. So those lines from music and readings that we hear about for our children and for our children's children are very real to me every day. The song called for Sunday. Someday. It's a hope-filled sentiment that fills the hearts and minds of parents and grandparents and echoes down through the ages. I've been thinking a lot about how in these times, when so much of the reality of America's history, particularly its racial history, is being surfaced and there for all of us to see. Paternity and patriarchy, that negative side of that, and men's power needs to be talked about with honesty. The music of Hamilton in this song from it can artfully help us to explore issues of history and contemporary realities in unique ways and invites us all to explore what might be possible someday. Now the backstory of that song, Dear Theodosia, from the Broadway musical Hamilton, has some intriguing historical and contemporary facets. Now the play's historic timeline is a story about two young founding fathers, um, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton, informs us of the sometimes cooperative and often combative relationship between these two young men who helped found a new nation. Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton were also, as the revolution began, recently had become fathers. The song Dear Theodosia is sung in the musical to Burr's beloved daughter, and Hamilton sings in to honor his equally loved young son, Philip. Now those two young fathers may have been rivals in song, but in what this song, which is sometimes called the father song, they sing in harmony. For they share the common affections that are born when one becomes a father. All of us who are parents know from direct experience, and all who have observed parents know that the bond that emerges and grows from the birth of one's child is sometimes far from rational. Parenthood is a crazy kind of love. My eldest son coined a word that I think is parents understand, and the word is paranoia. <laughs> a kind of fear that we fear that we experience when we become parents, and you know what, even when they grow up, it does not go away. Parenthood is a special kind of love that gets passed down generation after generation after generation. I believe it's a manifestation of universal love. 
The songwriter and playwright Lin-Manuel Miranda understood that bond. His own first son, Sebastian, was born about a year before Hamilton opened initially off-Broadway. So I suspect the song is at least as much about Sebastian Manuel as it is about those historic and much-loved children, Philip Hamilton and Theodosia Byrne. Miranda wrote, and in the play as Hamilton sang, I'll make the world safe and sound for you. We'll bleed and fight for you. We'll make it right for you. If we lay a strong enough foundation, we'll pass it on to you. We'll give the world to you. We'll give the world to you. That's what all healthy parents want to do, to pass on to our children and our children's children a healthy, safe, and loving world. In these times, we need to fight and perhaps believe to assure that it's a just world where no father's son, no mother's son, is at risk of violence. When I became a father, everything shifted for me. I was, at 27 years old, a similar age to Hamilton and Burr when they became parents. But unlike those highly motivated young founding fathers, I was a bit of a vagabond floating between interests and in and out of college and changing majors while in school. It was, after all, the late 1960s and the early 1970s when seeking relevance was many a young person's primary quest. The counterculture, which I embraced fully, invited us to be part of a new revolution of values that was far less clearly focused than the one those founding fathers had engaged in. Though I had from a young age shared their goal of making a better world. Not long after my eldest son Ian was born, I took a job working as a preschool teacher at the University of Oregon's student child care program. It paid kind of okay, and it included health insurance benefits and nearly free tuition at the university. I thought I'd do that for a couple of years. Well, two more kids, a master's degree in early childhood education, and 32 years later, I retired as the director of those same now expanded child care programs. My kids, each in their own way, actualized the song's lines. Someday, someday, yeah, you'll blow us all away. My kids really blew me away. There are many young people coming of age these days who blow us all away. Some, like two of my three children, are academic researchers seeking, seeking new information to help light a new way towards a better world. Some are getting increasingly involved politically and even running for office. Some are the young leaders of Black Lives Matter and some of the thousands of young people who have been joining them in calling for a new, more just America. A new generation of amazing young and women is stepping up to take up the choice of greater peace, love, liberty, and justice. And they invite us to run or walk or roll along behind them. We especially need our sons to be part of a new American future, one that is different with what has been America's history and is too prevalent in our current reality. Any doubt of the continuing power of patriarchy in America was erased by the 2016 presidential our federal government's cruel and harsh action at the border, separating asylum-seeking refugees from their families, foregoes compassion and caring to affirm harsh patriarchal goals of political power and control. And the violent reaction to mostful, mostly peaceful protests we've recently seen serves as a stark reminder of the assertion of patriarchal power that exists within our goals of maintaining 
order. Our children have inherited a world full of patriarchy and entrenched imbalance that is in need of some revolutionary change. Patriarchy and overt misogyny, though, are nothing new in America. As all of you know, the history of the beginning of this country had little mention of the founding mothers. When the founding fathers wrote, all men are created equal, it was an expression of more than just politically correct speech. It was the reality of the time. Beyond Betsy Ross, whose major accomplishment was sewing, and some letters from an obviously intelligent and capable Abigail Adams and Martha Washington, few women surfaced in the early American history most of us study. Yet these women were the ones who kept the home fires burning and businesses functioning in the 1770s and beyond, while the men went out there and fought the Revolutionary War and did the public work of giving birth to a new nation. And it was indeed a new and different nation, one founded on basic principles of justice and equality and liberty for all. Or at least that's what they said, but in truth, the revolution that the Founding Fathers brought about only changed the lives of a privileged few. As the historian Mark Kahn describes in his book, The Gendering of American Politics, Founding Mothers, Founding Fathers, and the Political Patriarchy, wrote, The American founders spoke the language of liberty and equality, but they simultaneously promoted the exclusion of women from politics and the subordination of most men to an elite male leadership. In one sense, he writes that the American Revolution, the U.S. Constitution, and the Bill of Rights changed very little in the lives of the people. Half of the population, women, did not gain new civil liberties, civil, political, or legal rights. Meanwhile, many men were no better off politically after the Revolution than before it. Poor men and itinerants continued to be disenfranchised. Black men, like black women, still suffered brutality and slavery, and Indians were treated as barbarian outsiders. Yet Kahn affirms the rhetoric, the language the founders used, lifted up new questions about power and legitimacy that continued to percolate and over time have bubbled up again and again into our own time. The founding mothers, including women who spoke out like Abigail Adams and Judith Sargent Murray, and a quieter, more, no less powerful cadre of women who kept plantations and farms and businesses functioning, were doing work behind the scenes. The elite male leadership soon learned that they needed to acknowledge that women and those men without property at least needed to consent to be governed. Khan notes that the American founders left us a mixed legacy. He reports that they perpetuated gender bias. They won a revolution and framed a constitution that excluded women from politics and subordinated large numbers of men. Yet, he tells us, in the midst of it all, the founding mothers and fathers helped to weaken gender bias and to disseminate a revolutionary rhetoric that would be used in later struggles. The American founding parents planted seeds. For example, if the king was not the supreme patriarchal authority on earth, then the absolute power of any patriarch was open to question. For some, that even meant the Holy Father. New ideas and new ideals began to take a life of their own, and they had outlived their authors and expanded far beyond the framers' original intentions. As the 20th century American leader, John F. Kennedy, advised us, a man or a woman may die, nations rise and 
thought, but an idea lives on. An idea lives on. Ideas have endurance without death. Ideas don't die. Kahn writes that the founding fathers and founding mothers initiated discussions and debate about the relationships between gender and politics that we continue to carry on today. I firmly believe we are on the cusp of a new revolution in values, a change from old paradigms. The Me Too movement, with its demands for clear sexual consent, has made condemnations and punishments and ostracizations for those who have misused power. And they've made that kind of action increasingly the norm. They've defined what is clearly not acceptable. More women are running for political office and demanding a seat at the tables of power. The Black Lives Movement, originally launched and often still led predominantly by black women, has demanded that the streets be safe for all the people, for everyone's daughters and everyone's sons. Now much of this is in reaction to the paternalistic extremes of the current national leadership, not least of all from our president. Extremes which also include the overreaction by many police forces across the nation. Yet these times are precisely the kinds of times where change begins. As the poet Carol Lee Sanchez writes, no new thought can come into being without disruption. No new thought can come into being without disruption. New ways of thinking or being can come only with some turmoil. The status quo doesn't just turn over. The responsibility to bring about change will continue to rest not only on the women who say no and who step up, but also on young boys and men who say yes to new, more truly equitable standards of behavior. The change needed will need the engagement of men and women who are committed to true racial justice and willing to disrupt systems of patriarchy and white supremacy. A revolution in values that is multi-generational will need parents who increasingly are free of allegiances to gender and racially based paradigms of power. I'm glad my own daughter was gifted with a sense of empowerment by some pretty powerful women. In my own lives, my sons, Ian and Nick, and my three-month-old grandson, Jasper, and your sons and grandsons, who are and will continue to be the most important partners in that kind of work. Fathering has changed, and it continues to change. I had the opportunity in my decades spent in childcare to see profound changes in the style and the substance of fathering. I want to lift up an example today of a current father who is part of that change. He's my former neighbor and my friend, and I would call him my teacher, Corey Hess. Corey and his wife, Teresa, and their three daughters, Rose, Fiona, and Simone, lived next door to me for five years. Well, actually, Simone only lived next door to me for three years because she was born next door to me. Corey does energy-focused body work in, Angli in Langley, Washington, and led a small meditation group I was part of. For five years, earlier in his life, he was a Zen monk in Japan, where he studied with the noted Zen master Hirata Roshi. He wrote a blog post he titled, Zen Dad. Corey wrote, My three daughters are so gorgeous and brilliant they have demolished my former unconscious corners of my mind, which felt superior as a man. <laughs> I am swimming in estrogen. Someone is always yelling at my house or crying or emoting or bossing me around and telling me, 
No. <laughs> My main form of bonding is as the wrestling partner and movie watcher. I tell bad jokes like any other dad. Being a dad has humbled me, exhausted me, made my functioning container much bigger. I am more patient. Our lives are just very real, not abstract, not glamorous. We get everyone fed. Our main hope as parents is to let their spirits soar, allowing their own process canvas to explore how they will uniquely move through the world, allowing them to stay connected to their own internal compass as we are all born knowing our own true north. Zen really taught me, taught us to become what is in front of us. Well, kids are the best practice for that. If you think you are good at that, try playing Barbie for a couple of hours and see how open and flexible you are. The Roshi has nothing on a four-year-old with a Barbie plan. <laughs> Chances are you'll be freaking exhausted after that. Corey continues, We must live a fresh life, full of mistakes and tough times and stress, but with a joy running through all of them, being right in the middle of our experience, being uplifted by this great life energy, sharing this very humbling light with everyone. This is the ever deepening joy, deepening and joyous work of this dad and husband and artist, including everything. Living in the breath of life, in the palm of the Buddha, integrating Kenzo, this way. Kenzo is defined as insight, an understanding of reality as it is. Reality as it is. That's what Corey tells us parenting invites us to experience. Reality not as one might seek it to be, not the one might want to, through patriarchal power, make it be. But a pure and simple, true reality we marvel at as it unfolds in the lives of our children and our children's children. We desperately need for ourselves and for our planet a new non-patriarchal paradigm. Lynn Manuel Miranda knew that the words he put into the mouths of his characterized versions of Hamilton and Burr were not mere echoes from the past. The words he wrote for the characters and himself to sing offer us a song for our times and a vision for a future that we can begin to build. It's a future filled with true opportunity for all. It's a just future, a peace-filled future in time, a happy future. True change, lasting, profound, paradigm change takes generations. This is both a challenge and a gift. A wise and gentle man who was a father figure to a generation of young people in America, the Reverend Fred Rogers, or as most of him know him, Mr. Rogers said. One of the greatest dignities of humankind is that each success, successive generation is invested in the welfare of each new generation. And so each successive generation sings, we'll make the world safe and sound for you. We'll make it right for you. We'll pass it on to you. We'll give the world to you. May we all work to make it so. One positive step, one positive gesture at a time. Maybe so. Dennis, that was such a moving talk, really encompassing all the elements of fatherhood. We appreciate it. 
We'll go on now to the offering part of our service. It was announced in the Sayusla News that our community partner for May and June, the Boys and Girls Club, will reopen its doors on June 22nd after being authorized to reopen as an emergency child care center. Although the Boys and Girls Club receive a nice donation from Peace Health, money is still tight. And we ask you, our foo friends, to consider a donation to the Boys and Girls Club, along with your regular donation to our fellowship. You can do so by mailing us a check to the P.O. Box 2502, Florence 97439, as you know, or visit our website and click on the PayPal button, where you can donate using your own credit card. Either way, you can designate how much goes to FOOF and how much goes to Boys and Girls Clubs, and we will take care of the distribution. As always, your continued practice, a spiritual practice of giving, is always appreciated. The more we give of ourselves, the more we receive. That is the law of abundance. Blessed be. I'm now inviting Jim again up to her to extinguish the flame of our chalice as I share the following. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, nor the fire of commitment, or the warmth of community. For these we hold in our hearts until we are together again. Reverend Dennis will come forward to conclude our service before we enjoy our peace song, sung by so many foofers. Please uh, enjoy the music and stay till the very end. Thank you, Reverend Dennis. I'd like to offer these closing words of benediction. May we go forward in purposeful, purposeful rhythm, that we may give voice to the melody of our imaginations, the music of our souls, and all the possibilities of a just world, as we might together create it. Shalom, salam, amen, and blessed be.